All right, we're on page 114. This is self-titled Fugitive. The blowing of a single autumn leaf. He turned and the mechanical hound was there. It was half across the lawn, coming from the shadows, moving with such drifting ease that it was like a single solid cloud of blade, black gray smoke blown at him in silence. It made a single last leap into the air, coming down at Montag from a good three feet over his head. Its spidered legs reaching, the procaine needle snapping out its single angry tooth. Montag caught it with a bloom of fire, a single wondrous blossom that curled in petals of yellow and blue and orange about the metal dog, clad it in a new covering as it slammed into Montag and threw him ten feet back against the bowl of a tree, taking the flame gun with him. He felt it scrabble and seize his leg and stab the needle in for a moment before the fire snapped the hound up in the air, burst its metal bones at the joints, and blew out its interior in a single flushing of red color, like a skyrocket fastened to the street. Montag lay watching the dead alive thing fiddle the air and die. Even now it seemed to want to get back at him and finish the injection, which was now working through the flesh of his leg. He felt all of the mingled relief and horror at having pulled back only in time to have just his knee slammed by the fender of a car hurtling by at 90 miles an hour. He was afraid to get up, afraid he might be able, not be able to gain his feet at all with an anesthetized leg. A numbness and a numbness hollowed into a numbness. And now, the street empty, the house burnt like an ancient bit of stage scenery. The other homes dark, the hound here, Beatty there, the three other firemen another place, and the salamander. He gazed at the immense engine. That would have to go too. Well, he thought, let's see how badly off you are. On your feet now. Easy, easy. There. He stood, and he had only one leg. The other was like a chunk of burnt pine log he was carrying along as a penance for some obscure sin. When he put his weight on it, a shower of silver needles gushed up the length of the calf and went off in the knee. He wept. Come on. Come on, you. You can't stay here. A few house lights were going on again down the street, whether from the incidents just passed or because of the abnormal silence following the fight. Montag did not know. He hobbled around the ruins, seizing at his bad leg when it lagged, talking and whimpering and shouting directions at it and cursing it, pleading with it to work for him now when it was vital. He heard a number of people crying out in the darkness and shouting. He reached the backyard in the alley. Beatty, he thought, you're not a problem now. You always said, don't face a problem, burn it. Well, now I've done both. Goodbye, Captain. And he stumbled along the alley in the dark. A shotgun blast went off in his leg every time he put it down and he thought, you're a fool, a damn fool, an awful fool, an idiot, an awful idiot, a damn idiot, and a fool, a damn fool. Look at the mess and where's the mop? Look at the mess and what do you do? Pride. Damn it. You temper and you've junked it all. At the very start, you vomit on everyone and on yourself. But everything at once, but everything one on top of another, Beatty, the women, Mildred, Clarice, everything. No excuse, though. No excuse. A fool. A damn fool. Go give yourself up. No. We'll save what we can. We'll do what there is left to do. If we have to burn, let's take a few more with us. Here. He remembered the books and turned back, just on the off chance. He found a few books where he had left them, near the garden fence. Mildred, God bless her, had missed a few. Four books still lay hidden where he had put them. Voices were wailing in the night and flash beams swirled about. Other salamanders were roaring, their engines far away, and police sirens were cutting their way across town with their sirens. Montag took the four remaining books and hopped, jolted, hopped his way down the alley and suddenly fell as if his head had been cut off and only his body lay there. Something inside it jerked him to a halt and flopped him down. He lay where he had fallen and sobbed. His legs folded, his face pressed blindly to the gravel. Beatty wanted to die. In the middle of the cry, Montag knew it for the truth. Beatty had wanted to die. He just stood there, not really trying to save himself, just stood there. Joking, needling, thought Montag, and the thought was enough to stifle his sobbing and let him pause for air. How strange. Strange to want to die so much that you let a man walk around armed, and then instead of shutting up and staying alive, you go on yelling at people and making fun of them until you get them mad, and then at a distance running feet. 
Montag sat up. Let's get out of here. Come on, get up. Get up. You just can't sit. But he was still crying and that had to be finished. It was going away now. He hadn't wanted to kill anyone, not even Beatty. His flesh gripped him and shrank as if it had been plunged in acid. He gagged. He saw Beatty, a torch, not moving, fluttering out on the grass. He bit at his knuckles. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, God. Sorry. He tried to piece it all together to go back to the normal pattern of life a few short days ago. Before the sieve and the sand, denims, dentrophus, moth voices, fireflies, the alarms and excursions. Too much for a few short days. Too much indeed for a lifetime. Feet ran in the far end of the alley. Get up, he told himself. Damn it, get up, he said to the leg and stood. The pains were spikes driven in the kneecap and then only darning needles and then only common ordinary safety pins. And after he had shagged along 50 more hops and jumps, filling his hand with slivers from the board fence, the prickling lot was like someone blowing a spray of scalding water on that leg and the leg was not was at last his own leg again. He had been afraid that running break might break the loose ankle but now sucking all the night into his open mouth and blowing it out pale with all the blackness left heavily inside himself, he set out in a steady jogging pace and carried the books in his hands. He thought of Faber. Faber was back there in the steaming lump of tar that had no name or identity now. He had burnt Faber too. He felt so suddenly shocked by this that he felt Faber was really dead, baked like a roach in that small green capsule shoved and lost in the pocket of a man who is now nothing but a framed skeleton strung with asphalt tendons. You must remember, burn them or they'll burn you, he thought. Right now, it's as simple as that. He searched his pockets. The money was there, and in his other pocket, he found the usual seashell upon which the city was talking to itself in the cold black morning. Police alert, wanted, fugitive in city, has committed murder and crimes against the state. Name, Guy Montag, occupation, fire, last seen. He ran steadily for six blocks in the alley, and then the alley opened out into a wide, empty thoroughfare, ten lanes wide. It seemed like a boatless river from there in the royal light of the high white arc lamps. You could drown trying to cross it, he felt. It was too wide. It was too open. It was a vast stage without scenery, inviting him to run across, easily seen in the blazing illumination, easily caught, easily shot down. The seashell hummed in his ear. Watch for a man running. Watch for the running man. Watch for a man alone, on foot. Watch. Montag pulled back in the shadows. Directly ahead lay a gas station, a great chunk of porcelain snow shining there, and two silver beetles pulling in to fill up. Now he must be clean and presentable if he wished to walk, not run, stroll calmly across that wide boulevard. It would give him an extra margin of safety if he washed up and combed his hair before he went on his way to get... Where? Yes, he thought, where am I running? Nowhere. There was nowhere to go, no friend to turn to, really, except Faber. And then he realized that he was indeed running toward Faber's house instinctively. But Faber couldn't hide him. It would be suicide even to try. But he knew that he would go to see Faber anyway for a few short minutes. Faber's would be the place where he might refuel fuel his fast draining belief in his own ability to survive. He just wanted to know that there was a man like Faber in the world. He wanted to see the man alive and not burned back there like a body shelled in another body. And some of the money must be left with Faber, of course, to be spent after Montag ran on his way. Perhaps he could make the open country and live on or near the, the rivers and near the highways and the fields and hills. A great whirling whisper made him look to the sky. The police helicopters were rising so far away that it seemed someone had blown the gray head off of a dry dandelion flower. Two dozen of them flurry, wavering, indecisive, three miles off like butterflies puzzled by autumn. And then they were plummeting down the land one by one here, there, softly kneading the streets where, turned back to beetles, they shrieked along the boulevards, or suddenly leapt back into the air continuing their search. And here was the gas station, its attendants busy now with customers. Approaching from the rear, Montag entered the men's washroom. Through the aluminum wall, he heard a radio voice saying, War has been declared. The gas was being pumped outside. The men and the beetles were talking, and the attendants were talking about the engines, the gas, the money owed. Montag stood trying to make himself feel the shock of the quiet statement from the radio. But nothing would happen. 
the war would have to wait for him to come to it in his personal file an hour, two hours from now. He washed his hands and face and toweled himself dry, making little sound. He came out of the washroom and shut the door carefully and walked into the darkness and at last stood again on the edge of the empty boulevard. There it lay, a game for him to win, a vast bowling alley in the cool morning. The boulevard was as clean as the surface of an arena two minutes before the appearance of certain unnamed victims and certain unknown killers. The air over and above the vast concrete river trembled with the warmth of Montag's body alone. It was incredible how he felt his temperature could cause the whole immediate world to vibrate. He was a phosphorescent target. He knew it. He felt it. And now he must begin his little walk. Three blocks away, a few headlights glared. Montag drew a deep breath. His lungs were like burning brooms in his chest. His mouth was sucked dry from running. His throat tasted of bloody iron and there was rusted steel in his feet. What about those lights there? Once you started walking, you'd have to gauge how fast those beetles could make it down here. Well, how far was it to the other curb? It seemed like a hundred yards. Probably not a hundred, but figure for that anyway. Figure that with him going very slowly, at a nice stroll, it might take as much as 30 or 40 seconds to walk all that way. The beetles? Once started, they could leave three blocks behind them in about 15 seconds. So even if halfway across he started to run, put his right foot out and then his left foot and then his right, he walked on the empty avenue. Even if the street were entirely empty, of course, you couldn't be sure of a safe crossing. For a car could appear suddenly over the rise four blocks further on and be on and past you before you had taken a dozen breaths. He decided not to count his steps. He looked neither to left nor right. The light from the overhead lamp seemed as bright and revealing as the midday sun and just as hot. He listened to the sound of the car picking up speed two blocks away on his right. His movable headlights jerked back and forth suddenly and caught at Montag. Keep going. Montag faltered, got a grip on the books, and forced himself not to freeze. Instinctively, he took a few quick running steps, then talked out loud to himself and pulled up to a stroll again. He was now half across the street, but the roar from the Beatles' engines whined higher as it put on speed. The police, of course. They see me. But slow. Now slow, quiet. Don't turn. Don't look. Don't seem concerned. Walk. That's it. Walk. Walk. The beetle was rushing. The beetle was roaring. The beetle raised its speed. The beetle was whining. The beetle was in high thunder. The beetle came skimming. The beetle came in a single whistling trajectory. Fired from an invisible rifle. It was up to 120 miles an hour. It was up to 130 at least. Montag clamped his jaws. The heat of the racing headlights burnt his cheeks, it seemed, and jittered his eyelids and flushed the sour sweat all, out all over his body. He began to shuffle idiotically and talk to himself, and then he broke and just ran. Put out his legs as far as they would go and down, and then far out again and down and back and out and down and back, and God, he dropped a book, broke pace, almost turned, changed his mind, plunged on, yelling in concrete emptiness. The beetle scuttling after its running food, 200. 100 feet away, 90, 80, 70, Montag gasping, flailing his hands, legs up, down, out, up, down, out, closer, closer, hooting, calling his eyes, burnt white now, his head jerked, about to confront the flashing glare, now the beetle was swallowed in its own light, now it was nothing but a torch, hurtling upon him, all sound, all blare, now, almost on top of him, he stumbled and fell, I'm done, it's over, but the falling made a difference instant before reaching him, the wild beetle cut and swerved out. It was gone. Montag lay flat, his head down. Wisps of laughter trailed back to him with the blue exhaust from the beetle. His right hand was extended above him, flat. Across the extreme tip of his middle finger, he saw now as he lifted that hand, a faint sixteenth of an inch of black tread where the tire had touched in passing. He looked at that black line with disbelief getting to his feet. That wasn't the police, he thought. He looked down the boulevard. It was clear now. A car full of children, all ages. God knew from 12 to 16, out whistling, yelling, hurrahing, had seen a man. A very extraordinary sight, a man strolling, a rarity, and simply said, let's get him, not knowing he was the fugitive Mr. Montag. Simply a number of children out for a long night of roaring five or six hundred miles in a few moonlit hours. 
their faces icy with wind, and coming home or not coming at dawn, alive or not alive, that made the adventure. They would have killed me, thought Montag, sweating, the air still torn and stirring about him in dust, touching his bruised cheek. For no reason at all in the world, they would have killed me. He walked toward the far curb, telling each foot to go and keep going. Somehow he had picked up the spilled books. He didn't remember bending or touching them. He kept moving them from hand to hand as if they were a poker hand he could not figure. I wonder if they were the ones who killed Clarice. He stopped and his mind said it again, very loud. I wonder if they were the ones who killed Clarice. He wanted to run after them, yelling. His eyes watered. The thing that had saved him was falling flat. The driver of that car, seeing Montag down, instinctively considered the probability that running over a body at such a high speed might turn the car upside down and spill them out. If Montag had remained an upright target, Montag gasped. Far down the boulevard, four blocks away, the beetle had slowed, spun about on two wheels, and was now racing back, slanting over on the wrong side of the street, picking up speed. But Montag was gone hidden in the safety of the dark alley for which he had set out on a long journey. An hour, or was it a minute ago? He stood shivering in the night, looking back out as the beetle ran by and skidded back to the center of the avenue, whirling laughter in the air all about it. Gone. Further on, as Montag moved in darkness, he could see the helicopters falling, falling like the first flakes of snow in the long winter to come. The house was silent. Montag approached from the rear, creeping through a thick night moistened scent of daffodils and roses and wet grass. He touched the screen door and back, found it open, slipped in, moved across the porch, listening. Mrs. Black, are you asleep in there? He thought. This isn't good, but your husband did it to others and never asked and never wondered and never worried. And now since you're a fireman's wife, it's your house and your turn. For all the houses your husband burned and the people he hurt without thinking, the house did not reply. He hid the books in the kitchen and moved from the house again to the alley and looked back and the house was still dark and quiet, sleeping. On his way across town with the helicopters fluttering like torn bits of paper in the sky, he phoned the alarm at a lonely phone booth outside a store that was closed for the night. Then he stood in the cold night air, waiting, and at a distance, he heard the fire sirens start up and run, and the salamanders coming, coming to burn Mr. Black's house while he was away at work, to make his wife stand shivering in the morning air while the roof let go and dropped in upon the fire. But now, she was still asleep. Good night, Mrs. Black, he thought. All right, that's where we'll stop.